Like any industry, trends in video games exist in a perpetually reactionary state. What becomes popular at the time, what captures the cultural zeitgeist, dozens upon dozens of products follow suit in some form. Whether influenced more obviously or by simply taking small inspiration, this is always happening. From software debuts games like Demon's Souls and Dark Souls, many others follow suit, whether taking elements from it like Respawn's Jedi Fallen Order, or wholesale copies of the style like with Code Vein, or more recently, Lies of P. While these replications of past successes are definitely worth discussing, what I find really interesting are how sudden trends affect games, types of storytelling and themes that blow up and send shockwaves throughout the industry. It's not necessarily about taking influence in gameplay, but about how a single game can shift demographic targets for an entire industry, leading developers to take that influence and apply it to their own own projects, big or small. I want to talk about this trend within the context of two games, Kingdom Hearts 2, which of course you know about that one already, but what of the other one? Well, let's discuss the influence of arguably one of the most influential games of the 2000s that, yes, even affected Kingdom Hearts, Grand Theft Auto 3. Released in October of 2001 exclusively at the time for the PlayStation 2, Grand Theft Auto 3 was nothing short of a watershed moment for the video game industry. Leaping into the new generation of consoles, GTA 3 not only popularized the open world genre, but also ushered in a new era of more mature video games. That's not to say video games made for the older, not kid demographic weren't a thing, but GTA 3 was so huge it was a demographic that was thrust into the spotlight with lots of money in hand, ready to buy. Previously, the big AAA experiences of the gaming world were more kid and family friendly, your Crash Bandicoots, your Banjo-Kazooies, your Crocs, your Spyros, etc. This vibe carried through into the early years of the PlayStation 2, Nintendo GameCube, and Xbox. For example, Naughty Dog's first game for the PS2 stayed true to their Crash roots with Jack and Dash the Precursor Legacy, released the same year as GTA 3. It was family friendly, bright colors, some nice upgraded storytelling, but nothing in that involved. It was a great game, well reviewed, well received, loved to this day. However, after the release of GTA 3, the studio quickly pivoted and suddenly, two years later, we had Jack 2. A darker, more moody piece, Jack 2 shared its DNA with its predecessor, but now also Grand Theft Auto 3. A more open world city design with guards that would attack you when alerted, a much more involved cinematic storyline with a hell of a lot more cutscenes, and most defining of all, an aim at older audiences. Jack and Daxter was now a T for Teen rated franchise with more violence, suggestive dialogue, and language. Looking back now, it's still an extremely radical shift tonally that people still argue about today whether it was the right choice or not. Whatever your opinion, that was the power of Grand Theft Auto 3. It took industry headlines by a storm and led to the industry overall to start appealing more towards older players with their blockbuster titles. This was felt well into the 2000s, arguably reaching the peak of this more dark and gritty phase of video gaming around 2004 and 2005. That desire to appeal to older audiences, the desire to be taken more seriously and be darker and more dramatic, led to such titles like Square Enix's own Dirge of Cerberus Final Fantasy VII, taking a spin-off of an RPG and making it into a third-person shooter. The revitalized Prince of Persia franchise from Ubisoft veered quite dramatically into darker, more mature territory as well. I'm using air quotes with that use of mature, might I add. When the sequel to Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, Prince of Persia, Warrior Within, jumped from mystical fantasy to a grim, M-rated world filled with monsters, blood and gore, angst, and villains and thongs. I just... Villains and thongs. Good lord. Oh, and lest we forget, Shadow the Hedgehog got a gun and started saying swears. A cultural moment. Where's that? Damn, fourth chaos emerald. While all of these examples are easily some of the most obvious when it comes to seeing the GTA influence on gaming, the mission to age up franchises also hit Kingdom Hearts. Yes, seriously. It very uniquely also primarily hit on one title, Kingdom Hearts 2. Kingdom Hearts had been a franchise that tonally had stayed pretty consistent with its Square Enix melodrama merged with happy-go-lucky Disney characters, along with a helpful dose of optimism and hope paired with a little existential dread every now and then. A general summation, but with Kingdom Hearts 2 specifically, the series found a very odd edge to it that I feel is worth talking about. Now, I love Kingdom Hearts 2. Everyone loves Kingdom Hearts 2. Don't tell Kingdom Hearts Reddit you don't love Kingdom Hearts 2, they'll come for you. <laughs> but what I've always found interesting about the game is how suddenly it developed this edge to it in certain ways that never quite gels with the franchise as a whole, specifically with Sora. Now, I'm not talking about things like the Organization 13 of it all, mysterious figures in dark cloaks and the like. This kind of darker personality already existed in the Kingdom Hearts franchise from the first game. Hell, I'd even argue the original Kingdom Hearts is the outwardly darkest title in the series, filled with more scary, spooky environments and enemies than any other in the series. I mean, look at this thing. 
From just watching the secret endings of the original Kingdom Hearts, it was clear series director Tetsuya Nomura wanted the series to go to a darker place while still being family friendly. No bong villains here. But in some moments, Kingdom Hearts 2 still has this odd, edgy style to its writing that never really returns in future titles. A key example is this moment early on when Sora attempts to confront Organization 13 on his first visit to Hollow Bastion. Oh dear. I think you got the wrong impression. You gonna cry? I'm sorry, who are you? Is this, is this Sora? I find this moment so off-putting, personally. It's such a minor bit in the grand scheme of things, and if you know the complete story of Kingdom Hearts like I do, first of all, sorry for the bird you bear, I understand. This is a truly grand scheme. It genuinely feels like an out-of-character moment for Sora, and yes, he can be a bit quippy in this series. You're stupid! But it was generally directed towards his friends like Riku, along with Donald and Goofy, more so Donald. Here, though, he throws a juvenile insult at villains he's only just now technically meeting due to Chain of Memory shenanigans. There's other instances too, and yes, it is funny to meme on them, and I'm sorry I'm about to use this as an example, but... Sorry, Mommy. Your poopsies are toast. Yeah. Making Sora an insult quip machine just feels off, and I'm glad this was abandoned after this game. It just never coalesces into what we know of Sora as a character. It just rings untrue, and it's especially noticeable as this is one of the few times Sora throws a bullying insult out like this in the entire series. It feels like this was part of an aim to give Kingdom Hearts 2 more of an edge to appeal to an older crowd. Look at our protagonist now. He's older. He's more mature. He throws out insults like he's a bully in junior high. It's just odd, and I'd argue the most egregious example of Kingdom Hearts 2's darker influence. He has other moments of sass too that stem more from confusion and those land a lot better. Roxas? Excuse me? It's just when they try to make it more of an edgy, insulting protagonist that the writing doesn't work. That's not all though. The game does indeed feel like a more mature story than Kingdom Hearts 1, and in this aspect they succeed. It doesn't necessarily skew to an older audience in my opinion, but with the tragedy of Roxas plus the more existential crises the characters go through throughout the game proves a bit more thought-provoking compared to the first game at least thematically. Sora's journey there was a traditional hero's journey, with the twist being that he wasn't supposed to be the eponymous hero. Riku was. Beyond that, though, it's a pretty traditional structure with good versus evil, rescuing the damsel, and the struggles and friends found along the way. With Kingdom Hearts 2, the cast becomes more sprawling, characters questioning if they truly exist and reckoning with the fact that they are, in fact, not fully human. I mean, Xemnas' whole goal as the leader of the Organization 13 is focused on the whole concept of becoming whole humans with hearts. It's more weighty subject matter, but in general, the game's tone still matches what comes before and what comes after. It's just these little pokes of weird edginess that immediately makes my brain go, oh yeah, this is a mid-2000s game. Sora's outfit is probably one of the more outright visual indicators of Kingdom Hearts 2's influence from the industry push for darker games. Whatever the design ethos, at first glance, Sora's color palette has switched from bright reds and blues to predominantly black. Darker colors, more edgy, more attempted appeal to older audiences. The natural interpretation of a character donning a darker outfit is that they're more of a moody hero than before. Think Venom-infected Peter Parker. Again, however, beyond certain quips and insults, Sora is still very much the same character. It points to inconsistent writing for the characters in Kingdom Hearts too. I personally find Cage 2 the weakest game in the series when it comes to writing. A lot of it comes off stilted and awkward while still nailing the emotional high points it's aiming for. Don't get me wrong, I still love the game, but it's always more interesting to talk about and discuss the themes and character arcs of the games instead of the dialogue itself. To me, Kingdom Hearts 2's story is made up of two pillars, Roxas' journey of self and Sora's journey to find his friends. Sora's story naturally gets more focus. He's the protagonist, after all. And in a way, it really serves as a showcase of what Kingdom Hearts is really trying to do as a franchise. There's the more traditional narrative of Sora's journey to becoming a Keyblade Master, visiting Disney World, meeting a bunch of new characters, and having a very external conflict trying to find Riku and King Mickey. On the other end, there's Roxas, who goes on a pretty intense internal journey, learning that the life he leads in Twilight Town is all a lie, as he reckons with the fact that he never truly was supposed to exist. Emotionally, both of these arcs are satisfying, arguably reaching their respective climaxes when Sora finally gets to Riku at the world that never was, and for Roxas when he sees Sora truly for the first time floating in his little memory incubation pod. These are the two biggest emotional high points for each character's corresponding stories, and that's not even mentioning the other major moments like the battle at Hollow Bastion and Roxas and Sora's duel. The emotional through lines are there, but the detail is where Kingdom Hearts 2 gets a bit lost, from the story stagnating and some Disney worlds not exactly caring through on any of the themes the game's exploring. Yes, I know, nothing happens in the Disney worlds is a common and valid complaint for the series, but Kingdom Hearts 2 probably is one of the bigger culprits of the franchise, with only a handful of Disney worlds truly progressing the plot upon first visit. It's only when you return to the world a second time, a choice I'm still not a personal fan of, 
does the organization truly become more involved in the stories and characters at each location, making these pit stops in the animated Disney filmography feel meaningful beyond escapism and references. It's a lot of disparate elements coming together, and again, while the emotional journeys are nailed beautifully, the moment-to-moment -moment storytelling can feel stagnant and awkward. There's clearly a desire for the series to grow up with its storytelling the more cerebral journeys of Roxas and others, but the game never fully finds its footing when it comes to pacing, leading to wild exposition dumps from Mickey Mouse and other characters. Then there's that edginess. Again, it's not pervasive throughout the game, but its influence is felt. Thank goodness the series never went full edgy like, say, Shadow the Hedgehog did. Oh, it's got a f***ing gun! Most everything is a product of its time in some form, and Kingdom Hearts 2 is no exception. Maybe it's less noticeable for people who arrived to the series more recently through the HD collections, but even the marketing of Kingdom Hearts 2 leaned into a somewhat darker approach, from multiple mysterious characters, shout out to the BHK, and a lot of focus on Mickey Mouse being a more prominent character, but in like a darker, more mysterious organization hood. Dark Mickey Mouse is such an inherently funny concept, honestly, and it never truly works as intended, but taking a cheerful Disney mascot and shrouding him in secrecy to make him seem like an edgier take on the character was very much a part of Kingdom Hearts 2's buildup. Hell, one of the final shots of Kingdom Hearts 1's secret ending was Mickey landing, Keyblade drawn, in shadow in a little action pose. Like, stop it. You're Mickey. I'm sorry, it's not working. That's not to say I don't love them, otherwise we wouldn't have this iconic moment. Say, fellas, did somebody mention the door to darkness? <coughs> Beyond that, there's the Final Fantasy of it all. I feel like this aspect of Kingdom Hearts 2 is less about the darker shift in style of video games at the time and more about, well, marketing Final Fantasy VII Advent children. We've got Cloud, we've got Yuffie, we've got Tifa, finally, and they're all in their respective new outfit designs from the new CGI movie that, surprise, was a thing around the same time as Kingdom Hearts 2. Final Fantasy characters, at least for the most part, generally bring more of a darker energy to the proceedings, contrasting with the Disney of it all. Honestly, I'm surprised they didn't lean into a more Dirt of Cerberus style and add Vincent Valentine to the Final Fantasy cast within Kingdom Hearts. Someday. Maybe. I beg. It's just a shame that the attempt at more edgy writing could have melded better with maybe, say, the darker storytelling of a Final Fantasy game like 7 instead of aiming for a more general edge because it was popular for the time. And instead we get these odd moments and, I guess, the entirety of the Pirates of the Caribbean world since it's the only Kingdom Hearts world based on a franchise rated PG-13. Speaking of Pirates of the Caribbean, the use of that film as a world in Kingdom Hearts 2 really is emblematic of the battle of tone within the game. Port Royal is based on Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, a 2003 film that was significant at the time for Disney as a company as it was the first time they released a movie under their name that was rated PG-13. Typically, darker material would instead be released under, say, Touchstone Pictures instead. It marked as a surprising choice for a Disney world in the lead-up to Kingdom Hearts 2's release. Even more interestingly, this is the world that received the most changes in its Western release. Compared to the Japanese version, the Western version of Port Royal changed things like how pirate enemies reacted to magic, to, probably most significantly, changing the animation of this one cutscene so that, instead of holding a gun to his own head as a threat, Will Turner instead just kind of puts his hand down and the gun is never pointed at himself. This, along with other edits to the game like the Hydra's blood change in the Hercules world of Olympus Coliseum, were seemingly done to keep Kingdom Hearts 2's ESRB rating in America rated E10+, and not push to the T for teen category. They wanted to be a little edgier, but they didn't want to commit to pushing things really any further than what the first game did. I understand the desire from a marketing standpoint to avoid the teen rating for Kingdom Hearts, but it's like trying to have your cake and eat it too. If you want to push for darker themes, entering that territory might mean a higher age rating for your game. Instead, we still get some more mature moments, but a lot of it feels in conflict with itself, not knowing exactly how to balance the dark and the light without being scary or violent in a way that would put off younger audiences. The funny thing is, I'd even argue that the first Kingdom Hearts is the scariest game in the series. The end of the world is just chock full of existential dread in its environments and overall vibe that really hasn't been matched in later games, let alone Kingdom Hearts 2. I guess it helps that it's not as explicit, and you can kind of miss things like the witnessing of a world crumbling to darkness if you aren't paying attention. It's just less overt compared to Will pointing a gun at his own head. One thing the edginess, but not a rating that would be a barrier of entry to change for young kids. That was the conundrum Kingdom Hearts 2 faced. There's always this adolescent idea of wanting to take things we loved as a kid and make them darker and edgier. Things again, like Shadow the Hedgehog, Bomberman Act Zero if you remember that, trying to cash in on this thought and yeah, it never works. It, truly never works. Various franchises have their audiences, their demographics, and Kingdom Hearts has always stayed firmly family friendly. Do I think the games could be darker? I guess, but it's such a tricky tonal balance that I really think it'd be too risky of an endeavor to pull off. The small experiments with Kingdom Hearts 2 serve as evidence of that. In North America, the Kingdom Hearts series is always rated E10+, or everyone 10 and up, a rating in between E for everyone and T for teen. The perfect sweet spot between both Disney and Square Enix, honestly. It has its niche, and with the slightly 
higher rating, the series can push into a bit darker territory with slightly stronger violence without alienating kids. As it is, Kingdom Hearts 2 serves as a symbol of Kingdom Hearts' growing pains as a franchise. Due to industry trends and the desire to develop a more mature story, the game has a tough time reconciling disparate tones to create a cohesive narrative experience. Like I've said, I love the game and its emotional moments really, really hit. Like the ending, come on. But for every, guess my summer vacation is over, we get a, you're gonna cry. While no game in the series is perfect, past Kingdom Hearts 2, the series found its footing with its tone, at least for the most part. Starting with Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, the series kind of figured out how it wanted to depict its darker themes and any kind of violence that came from that, in a way that still kept the franchise family friendly, but could still push into more mature territory. The course correction I'm most thankful for, honestly, is Sora. That you gonna cry haunts me to this day, can you tell? Sora's personality came into focus post Kingdom Hearts 2, and really, I think, flourished in Kingdom Hearts 3. He's a beacon of light, an optimist, but still struggling in his own right. Kingdom Hearts 3 makes great use of this in the Keyblade Graveyard where, when Sora breaks down at the loss of all of his companions, it's really felt after seeing him being such a bright, hopeful person. For this kid to lose hope, things must be truly bleak. It better fits the character in any awkward snark is jettisoned away with better character-driven humor that doesn't feel weird and out of nowhere. We even still get PG-13-based Disney worlds with the return of Pirates of the Caribbean here, and this time nothing feels weird. Well, that weird. They even make darker moments like Will dying work without having to worry about needing to change things to maintain a certain age rating. Overall, the weird push in the 2000s to darker games wasn't really a bad thing. Audiences were getting older and games were being developed to cater to that audience. That's, that's fine. The issues only arrived when games shifted in such a way trying to cater to that new demographic, causing them to lose their identity and why audiences were drawn to them in the first place. That's why when I say Grand Theft Auto 3 is one of the most influential games of all time, it's a neutral statement. There's both good and bad that came with that. The good Good, games became more ambitious in their gameplay and storytelling. The bad? Edginess and violence were deemed to be more important than consistent and good design, leading to very odd works that totally didn't work whatsoever. Thankfully, Kingdom Hearts 2 doesn't fly too close to the sun with this push for more mature games, but it definitely stumbles a little bit. Kingdom Hearts 2 is still an amazing, classic experience that is only hampered a bit by these weird decisions. At this point, it's sort of charming in a, oh yeah, mid-2000s kind of way. At worst, it's not amazing storytelling, but at best, it's really just some small nitpicks. I don't think Grand Theft Auto 3 is the reason I find the writing and storytelling in Kingdom Hearts too clunky, but its influence is definitely felt, and that's worth discussing. It's a less overt example of this trend in game development compared to, and I'm sorry to always bring it up, but it's just too easy, Shadow the Hedgehog, Damn. but the influence was still there in various small ways. This is definitely not meant to be a Kingdom Hearts 2 is secretly bad thing, by the way. I think it's clear that if you've hopefully watched this far, but it doesn't hurt to say it again, Kingdom Hearts 2 is a great game. It's just not a perfect one. And that's okay. The mid-2000s were such a wild time in the video game industry for various reasons. We're not even getting into the struggle that was the transition to the next generation of consoles. And when it comes to the influence of games like GTA 3, there's so much to talk about outside of just Kingdom Hearts 2. Again, thong villains. <laughs> Honestly, Kingdom Hearts 2 is barely even a footnote in this trend in the big picture, but I'm glad any negative influence the series received from these things wasn't felt too heavily. There will always be edgelord types wanting Kingdom Hearts to be super f***ing dark and teen, if not mature rated, but that's all just ridiculous. Content that age gates games and media in general isn't the marker of a good product, it's just flavor. And guess what? That can be bad. I'm of the opinion that people who want things they like that are kid-friendly to suddenly become real edgy and dark simply are insecure about their own interests. It's okay to like things that are family friendly, I promise. A game featuring Disney characters is meant to be family friendly. It's okay. It's all about matching the right kind of tone to the story you want to tell, and Kingdom Hearts generally threads that line well between its more jolly Disney content and the darker melodrama of its Final Fantasy-like storytelling. In the end, Kingdom Hearts 2 serves as a pretty fascinating point in the franchise. It's generally considered the best one to fans, but it also exists as an awkward stepchild when it comes to the series figuring out the story it wants to tell across multiple titles and exactly how to do that within its Disney mashup framework. Some things work, some things don't, but it all served as a way to set the series up for even bigger, deeper things in the future. It's a game I love to death, and hopefully things will ever get too awkward in the future. At the very least, Sora won't resort to junior high edgelord comebacks. Please, Square, I beg. No more. You gotta cry. Thank you everyone for watching, and a special shout out to my top patrons since my last video Barnacles for Bailey, Casper, Evan W., Gage Parks, Ivy, Jordan O'Neill, KH Guides, Mumpow, Miss KH Guides, Oyster Milk, Oz, and Permanent Violet. For even more videos, you can join my Patreon where I upload exclusive new videos each month. See you all next time.